Hi everyone, Dr. Mike here. In this video, we're taking a look at an introduction to blood. Let's have a look at all the various components inside of blood and what they do. So to begin, we need to remember that when we look at various tissues of the body, that they sit underneath four major categories. The four major tissue types are nervous, which is there for communication, muscle, which is there for contraction to perform work, allowing for us to basically move, so muscle for movement, epithelia, lines, organs and line structures and separates out one area from another, and then connective, which anchors and binds and holds things together. The reason why I'm bringing these four up is because blood is going to fit underneath one of these four. Which one? What do you think? Well, it's going to be, strangely enough, connective. Blood is a type of connective tissue. Now this is interesting because if I were to write blood underneath connective tissue and then list, let's say, two more different types of connective tissue, Bone is connective tissue, right? And so is cartilage. So let's write this down. We've got cartilage and we've got bone. Now think about those tissue types. Bone is a solid, we know that. Cartilage is a semi-solid and blood is a liquid. And taking a look at these three different types, you'd go, well, they're all connective tissue, but what makes them connective tissue? I can't see blood wrapping, binding, or holding anything together. How is it possibly connective tissue? Well, remember, connective tissue is made up of cells and gels. Cells and gels, and there's also fibers. So you could say cells, gels, and fibers. Now, it's the gels and fibers that change the consistency of the tissue. So for example, with bone, the major cell type that you have, even though there's many, are osteocytes. So we've got osteocytes. For cartilage, it's, do you know what type of cells are in cartilage? Chondrocytes. Chondrocytes. And then when we look at blood, well, there's many cell types, but again, you could argue that it's erythrocytes. And let's just write red blood cells. They're the cells. But what about the gels and the fibers? So here's the thing. Bone being a solid, it has the osteocytes surrounded by the interstitial fluid, right? There's always interstitial fluid surrounding cells. But the thing is with bone, that interstitial fluid has things dissolved in it. And those things include calcium and phosphate as well. Now when you've got calcium and phosphate inside of that interstitial fluid, it makes it really hard. But in addition to that, it makes it brittle. But we don't want bone to be brittle. We want it to have some degree of flexibility. So we're going to put some fibers in there like collagen. So now what we have is a solid tissue that's really hard because of these inorganics, this what we call hydroxyapatite, and collagen, which gives it a little bit of bendiness. But it's very solid. With cartilage, it also has collagen, which is why it's got that bendiness to it. But the thing is, it doesn't have the calcium and phosphate inside. Instead, of it's got basically carbohydrates. And so what that allows for it to be is not a liquid, but a semi-solid, a very flexible tissue. Now, let's take a look at blood. That's the focus of today. The blood has, in regards to what's dissolved in it, well, it's got things like solutes, right? So ions and nutrients and wastes, but it's keeping it as a liquid. Now, what's the fibers that's in blood? Well, we've got something called fibrinogen. Fibrinogen. Now, fibrinogen is inactive. It needs to be activated into fibrin. And what that does is it allows for blood to form clots. So this is that binding that we know of when we think of connective tissue. The binding and wrapping is the fact that blood can form clots and that's because of the fibers inside. But when you look at blood, it just looks like a liquid. So yes, blood is connective tissue just like bone and cartilage because it has cells, gels and fibers. The liquid inside is what we call plasma and that's where I want to first begin is looking at the components of blood. So I were to take blood out of your vein, for example, and I stick it in a tube, and I take this tube and I spin it in a centrifuge, what it does is it separates out layers within the blood. It separates out the components according to their density or their mass. And what you find is there are three layers. So let's have a look at these three layers. One, two, three. 
So we've got one, two, three layers of the blood. Let's start at the top and move our way down and have a look at these three layers and what they are. This very first layer at the top makes up most of your blood. So this layer up here, its name is plasma. So that's our blood plasma, and that makes up about 55% of your whole blood. Remember, if you're a male, you have around about five to six liters of blood in your body. If you're female, around about four to five liters of blood. But again, this changes and is variable depending on age and circumstance. So for example, if you're pregnant, you're gonna have a larger blood volume. If you're an athlete, you'll likely have a larger blood volume. So those things need to be taken into consideration. Generally speaking, your plasma, 55%, you've probably got around about three liters of plasma in your body. We think about it almost like there's about 45 mils per kilogram of body weight. So I'm 70 kilograms, so that's three liters, 3.1 liters of blood plasma. So that's 55%. It's this straw color. It looks a bit yellowish to it. What's inside of our plasma? Well, mostly it's water. So if we have a look at what's inside of our plasma, the first thing is that it's made up of water. In actual fact, 92% of that 55% is water. What is important about knowing this? Well, first thing that's important is we know that water is a boomerang when we look at it as a molecule. And we know that the hydrogen of this boomerang, so two hydrogen, one oxygen, has a slight positive charge and the oxygen has a slight negative charge. This is important because water, being a polar substance, charged, it likes other charged substances. And we know that if something's negative, it likes to be around positive stuff. And if it's positive, it likes to be around negative stuff. And because hydrogen uh, water has both positive and negative charges, it loves positive and negatively charged stuff. And that's important because it's going to be what we call a solvent. It allows for things to be dissolved in it. And it will follow any charges. I'll get to that point in a second. So 92% of our plasma is water. What else do we have? Well, another thing that's present inside is going to be our proteins. We have proteins in this blood plasma. And that makes up around about 7%. 7% of that 55% are proteins. And there's many different types. First protein I wanna focus on, which is the most abundant protein, is what we call albumin. Now, albumin probably makes up around about 60% of these, this 7% of proteins. I know we're breaking down these percentages. Most abundant protein in blood, basically. Liver produces albumin, and it plays a number of roles, two major roles that you should remember when it comes to albumin. The first of which is it's a carrier molecule. It carries stuff. The question is, what does it carry? Well, because blood is made up mostly of water, Lipid-soluble substances, like lipid-soluble hormones, fat-soluble hormones or drugs, really don't like just floating through the blood. It needs to be attached to a carrier, and that carrier is generally albumin. So albumin will carry many lipid-soluble substances. And like I said, these lipid-soluble substances can be drugs, or they can be hormones, and they can be other lipid-soluble substances within the body. The other function of albumin is it helps maintain our osmotic gradient or osmotic pressure. Now your question might be, what is this? What are we referring to here? Osmosis is the movement of water across a semi-permeable membrane, right? And the way I think about it is that when you have a molecule that's charged, remember proteins are mostly charged because they've got a phosphate backbone. So albumin is carrying this negative charge with it. Now what did I say loves following charges? Water. So wherever albumin goes, it pulls water towards it, and that's osmosis. So therefore, albumin is really important in maintaining the osmotic pressure, specifically the osmotic pressure within a blood vessel. So remember this particular concept. I'll quickly wipe this off, just so I've got more room. The concept is that of capillary exchange. So remember that if you have a blood vessel, so you've got the arterial end, and then you've got a capillary bed here, and there's all holes in this capillary bed. That makes sense because capillaries are the site of exchange. And then on the other end, we've got the venous end of the capillary bed. There we go. And again, holes here. And what we know is that we've got tissues outside of the capillary bed. And as the blood moves 
through, we need to push substances out. So what we're pushing out to the tissues here to be fed are gonna be things like oxygen and nutrients, right? But the thing is, the oxygen and nutrients, they're dissolved in the water. They're dissolved in the plasma. So plasma gets pushed out. Fluid. Now here's the thing. This happens at all the tissues of our body. If we keep pushing plasma out, we're gonna lose our entire blood volume within a day. So we need to find a way to reclaim this plasma. And the way that we reclaim that plasma, or pull it back in, is because we have negatively charged albumin that remain inside, I'll write A here, negatively charged albumin that remain in the blood vessel. It's too big to move out of the capillaries. So as the hydrostatic pressure, the blood pressure, pushes stuff out on the arterial end, on the venous end, it's pulling stuff back in because the albumin has a negative charge. Now that's important clinically because I said your liver makes albumin, so what if your liver isn't functioning very well? You don't have the albumin. You don't have the albumin, you can't pull this fluid back in. The fluid remains out in the tissues, and that's what we call edema. So the, again, the osmotic pressure here, the role of albumin in maintaining osmotic pressure, super important. So that's albumin as a protein. There's a couple of other proteins that you should be aware of, and we'll go through them quite quickly, are the globulins. So globulins are these proteins, and there's a couple of different types of globulins. So there are uh, alpha and beta globulins, but we also have gamma globulins as well. What are the differences? Well, a couple of things. Alpha and beta globulins, they do a bunch of stuff. Predominantly, they're similar to albumin in the sense that they are carriers, and they carry lipid-soluble stuff, but they also carry metal ions. So they carry things like copper, and iron. So not only do they carry fat soluble stuff, but they're carriers of metal ions. They can also play a role in inflammation, but let's just forget about that. So they're the alpha and beta globulins. Gamma globulin, you've probably heard of before, like immunoglobulin G. These are antibodies, right? And so these antibodies we know are produced by our B cells. Ultimately, the B cells turn into plasma cells and they produce these IgG antibodies. In another video where I talk about hematopoiesis and also the immune system, I cover this. So we've got globulins inside of our blood plasma as well. And the last protein I wanna to refer to before we move on is that of fibrinogen. Fibrinogen. I spoke about it before. What did I say fibrinogen does? It allows for us to clot. So this is also made by the liver many proteins are, and it's inactive. It needs to get activated by chopping off that O-G-E-N. If you want to understand more about fibrinogen and its role in blood clotting, I suggest you watch my hemostasis and blood clotting video. That covers all of the clotting cascade and hemostasis that you need to be aware of. So these are the proteins present within blood. That's not the only thing present in plasma. The other thing we have in plasma, which is making up pretty much the final, what, 1% is solutes. Now solutes is a generic term, meaning anything dissolved in a solvent. What's a solvent? Water is a solvent. Water is the biological solvent and things are dissolved in it. Things dissolved in it generally are polar, so have a charge to it, or they're very small. And so the types of solutes you're going to find inside of your blood include things like ions, nutrients, waste, hormones, gases. They're the major solutes that we're gonna find inside of our blood plasma. So ions, what am I referring to when I talk about these ions? Remember they're charged atoms or elements. Things like sodium, potassium, magnesium, chloride, hydrogen ions, bicarbonate ions, phosphate ions, you know, there's a whole bunch, right? So these are ions, just charged atoms or elements. Why are they important inside the blood? They're important because their quantity determines water movement as well. 
That's why we have electrolytes. Electrolytes are really important because they determine fluid balance. Maintaining blood volume, these ions are important. But that's not all they're important for. We spoke about, I didn't, calcium is also another one. We spoke about calcium and phosphate as ions in bone, right? Except they're dissolved inside of that bone and they form hydroxyapatite. They form, make the bone hard. But here, calcium and phosphate are important when it comes to signaling muscle contraction, neurons firing off. Same with when it comes to sodium and potassium. They all play individual and separate roles. Hydrogen ions are about pH, maintaining the pH, how acidic and basic the environment is. So they are present and dissolved within our blood, specifically the plasma. What nutrients are we referring to here? Mainly we're referring to things like glucose and amino acids. Now you might be thinking, but we also have fatty acids, part of triglycerides, but it's fat. And generally the fat and fatty acids like to travel through the lymphatic system. However, after a big meal, this plasma can get a little bit cloudy because you do have fatty acids floating around, but generally they're bound up to something, that for certain carrier molecules. So uh, like high density lipoproteins, for example. So they're the nutrients. Waste, what type of wastes do we have? So I'll just put an arrow there. What type of wastes do we have? Mainly things like urea and creatinine, just to name a couple, but there's also like uric acid. They're metabolic byproducts, right? So of protein metabolism, when we take nitrogen, remember amino acids, right? That's part of proteins. Amine means there's a nitrogen group and we need to get rid of that nitrogen group and we do that via urea. Creatinine is a byproduct of muscle metabolism. So creatine is required to hand phosphates back to ATP that's lost a phosphate, so basically hands them to ADP. And part of this um, metabolic process, a byproduct is creatinine. The interesting thing here is they're both generally produced and excreted um, at a normal regular amount, so we can measure them. And if they're abundant or if they're too high or too low, can give us an indication as to what might be happening in the body. Hormones. Well, there's a multitude of hormones and generally water soluble hormones, but I said that fat soluble hormones can also travel with albumin, for example. So there's many hormones that travel through the bloodstream and the gases are mostly oxygen and carbon dioxide. So these gases can be directly dissolved in the water of the blood plasma or they can be carried, which we'll talk about shortly. All right, so that's the blood Plasma. Let's now talk about this next layer here, the smallest layer, which its name is called the Buffy Coat. What a weird name, Buffy Coat. Now the Buffy Coat is this sort of whitish frothy layer, and it makes up around about 1% of total blood volume. What is inside of this Buffy Coat? Let's take a look. Well, inside of this Buffy Coat, we have two major things. First thing we have are leukocytes. Leukocytes. We also know leukocytes as white blood cells. White blood cells. What are our white blood cells? Well, a way I like to remember our white blood cells is the mnemonic, never let monkeys eat bananas. Wonderful. There's that mnemonic, and as we know, what do mnemonics do? You take the first letter from each of these, and it tells you what it is. So N is neutrophils. We've got neutrophils here. L is lymphocytes. Lymphocytes. M is monocytes. E is eosinophils. And B is basophils. So that's a great mnemonic to remember. And it also tells you about their quantity from highest to lowest. So neutrophils are the most abundant white blood cells and basophils are the least abundant white blood cells. What a great way to remember these. All right, just very quickly, what do they do? All right, white blood cells, part of the immune system, they help protect us. So there's an important protection role here. Neutrophils are usually, when it comes to an infection or some sort of damage to tissue, bacterial, viral, whatever it may be, neutrophils are usually the first to the site. And they're the first to die and they form pus. When you see pus, mostly dead neutrophils. They go in to help neutralize and also get rid of, clean up that area. Lymphocytes, there's two major types, which we know are T 
T cells and B cells, and there's subcategories of each, so we know there's T helper cells and cytotoxic T cells, and B cells can turn into plasma cells, which make those antibodies which we spoke about before. They're very important when it comes to our adaptive immune system. So they can develop a memory, an immunological memory. If they're exposed to a pathogen or an antigen, they can remember it. Monocytes. Monocytes turn into macrophages once they're in the tissue. So macrophages are big eaters. So monocytes in the blood sort of just wander around until they've been called upon by the neutrophils in the infected site and they move out of the blood vessel and once they're in the tissue they turn to macrophages, gobble things up. Monocytes can also seed particular tissues and become dendritic cells, very similar to macrophages. Then we've got eosinophils and basophils. A lot of overlap here, they're both important for allergic response and eosinophils well, and basophils, but are uh, important with parasitic, helping fight parasitic infections. So there are our white blood cells. When we have a look at the white blood cells in our whole blood, you'll find that we have around about 5,000 to 10,000 per microliter. Microliter, not mil, microliter. So that's one thousandth of a milliliter. We've got 5,000 to 1,000 leukocytes present. Now the other thing in the Buffy coat are thrombocytes. Thrombocytes. Now the other name we know thrombocytes as are platelets. Now we know platelets are really important when it comes to clotting and therefore they work intimately with fibrinogen and specifically fibrin. Again, watch that hemostasis or clotting cascade video for more details. So platelets are important. They're fragments of cells, right? So platelets aren't entire cells, they're fragments of cells. They actually come from one cell type called a mega karyocyte, which what it does really interestingly, it's made in the bone marrow. It becomes really big and it blebs out, like puts an arm through the sinusoidal capillaries into the bloodstream, and then basically chop, 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 chops this arm off, and those little chopped up pieces become platelets. Crazy. So how many platelets do we have per microliter if we're looking like we did with the thrombocytes? It's gonna be around about 200 to 400,000 per microliter. It's a lot, right? And again, their job is clotting. Finally, we're up to this last area here. So this last part is pretty much just compact red blood cells. And generally speaking, so let's write this down first. Compact red blood cells, let's call them by their names, erythrocytes, which we know as RBCs. Now, this is important because there's a, a thing called hematocrit. Now, measuring hematocrit is simply measuring the percentage of whole blood that's made up of erythrocytes. How do you do that? Well, you get a ruler. You go, you measure the length of that and find out the length of that and you divide them. Generally speaking, erythrocytes should make up around about 45% of your total blood volume. But it can be different between males and females. So for example, so again, let's write this down. The term is hematocrit. So measuring hematocrit is measuring the compact erythrocytes. Hematocrit. And for males, generally speaking, it's going to be 47% plus or minus 5%. And for females, it can be 42% plus or minus 5%, all right? So there's obviously a buffering capacity there. What's the whole point of these, uh, of doing a hematocrit and finding out the red blood cell percentage? Well, red blood cells are really important because they carry the gases within our body, right? So the RBCs are carrying oxygen and carbon dioxide, oxygen to the tissues to make, to produce ATP and getting rid of the waste product, which is carbon dioxide and sending it to the lungs. That's super important. Without this process, we die very quickly. And so we produce huge amounts of red blood cells. So comparing it to these two, red blood cells, we have around about 5 million per microliter. 
So an enormous amount, five million red blood cells per microliter, and this, and <clears throat> excuse me, they're just filled with hemoglobin, just filled with it. So if we were to have a look at a red blood cell, let's maybe draw it up here, right? Have a look at a red blood cell. What you'd find that it's around about, if we look at the length of it, it's around about eight micrometers, and its thickest area is around about two micrometers. Extremely flexible, can fold in upon itself. It's eight micrometers. So what happens is when you get to the smallest capillaries of the body, it's only wide enough to fit red blood cells through single file, one at a time, right? And the great thing is they've got the capacity to fold in upon themselves. They are filled with hemoglobin. Hemoglobin carries the oxygen and the carbon dioxide. I told you that oxygen and carbon dioxide can be dissolved directly in the plasma, and that's true, but the vast majority are going to be bound to either the heme portion, if it's oxygen, or the globin portion, if it's carbon dioxide. So they're filled with hemoglobin. There's no organelles, there's no nucleus, nothing. So they don't have the capacity to create new proteins and regenerate. So their lifespan is only around about 120 days. So how do we know when it's time for them to go? Well, as they get older, their shape starts to deform. They're less likely to be flexible and foldable and all those types of things. And so as the blood moves through all the different tissues of the body, it's gonna to get to places like the spleen and the liver where they have like a meshwork. And healthy red blood cells fit through no problem. But unhealthy old red blood cells get caught up. And there, like the spleen for example, which is the elephant graveyard for red blood cells, they're now targeted for destruction. And that means they pull it apart, they take the iron that's inside and they recycle it, they take the globin, which are amino acids, and recycle those amino acids, and then they take the heme and they undergo multiple processes of breaking that heme down. Think about bilirubin, for example, and you can poo and pee that out. And that gives you the color of your urine, which is that either yellowy color or the color of your poo, which is the brown color. So that is the red blood cell, carries the oxygen and carbon dioxide. Remember that when we look at the red blood cell, which carries the oxygen and carbon dioxide, it's filled with, I said, hemoglobin. Now hemoglobin is made up of four globin uh, molecules. You've got two alpha, which I'm gonna draw like that, and then two beta, which I'm gonna draw like that. That, this four, this here, is hemoglobin, right? So this here is, if I can spell it, hemoglobin. Now the thing is, embedded inside of each of these is heme. So these are just the globin, these are just the amino acids, the proteins, right? But inside you got this circular heme present, right? So now we've got the heme. And what the heme has, as like the crown jewels right in the middle, is an iron ion, an iron ion, iron ion. So that there is the iron ion, which is Fe2+. So there's four of them. So one hemoglobin molecule has four iron ions. Now here's the thing, one red blood cell has 250 million hemoglobin. Each has four iron ions. So multiply that by four, that means you have, the and this is the thing, the oxygen binds to the iron ion. So one hemoglobin can bind four oxygen. So 250 million hemoglobin times four right, because you can bind four oxygen to it, one billion, one billion, one billion oxygen molecules combined to in a single red blood cell. And we have five million red blood cells per microliter. So this is a summary and an overview of an introduction to blood. Hi everyone, Dr. Mike here. If you enjoyed this video, please hit like and subscribe. We've got hundreds of others just like this. If you want to contact us, please do so on social media. We are on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok at Dr. Mike Todorovic at D-R-M-I-K-E-T-O-D-O-R-O-V-I-C. Speak to you soon.